start. Welcome to this webinar uh, brought to you by Colliers International and Invest Hong Kong. Today we have a distinguished lineup of speakers. I have with me my colleague Herman with me in the office here and also uh, Dixon who's sitting in his office. Um, um, we're also joined by Dr. Rocky Tong. Thank you Rocky for joining us. Rocky is from the Financial Services Development Council, FSDC, as well as Piers Stewart from Colliers International. Thank you Piers for joining us. Um, our webinar today is titled New Opportunities in Financial, Financial Services from Closer Integration with the Greater Bay Area, the GBA. Um, the presentations today will start with Dixon, and Dixon will tell us about the GBA, the many opportunities that are arising from the fast and accelerating integration between GBA and Hong Kong. Actually, strictly speaking, GBA also includes Hong Kong. So it's nine cities in the mainland plus two cities, Hong Kong and, and Macau. So when we say the, the closer integration of Hong Kong and the GBA, actually, strictly speaking, is, is the GBA as a whole and what that means for business. Uh, he'll talk about Wealth Connect, Insurance Connect, virtual banks, virtual insurance, and what Hong Kong has to offer to companies who are aiming to serve this already massive but still fast growing market. Um, next, we'll have um, Herman, and Herman will tell us about capital markets and new opportunities arising from secondary listings uh, in Hong Kong by mainland technology companies who are already listed on the NASDAQ in the US. Rocky will talk after that, and he'll talk about the findings on his latest research report entitled Hong Kong's uh, Unique Role in Enhancing Financial Connectivity in the Greater Bay Area. This report was just released in June this year and sets out recommendations for Hong Kong's financial services sector to capture opportunities um, presented by the Greater Bay Area. Last but not least, we'll, we'll, have, um, we'll hear about the state of play with regards to the shortage of prime office space here in Hong Kong. Um, in the past, the cost and availability of office space um, in Hong Kong has been a chief concern for companies who are considering setting up a physical uh, office here. Uh, COVID-19 has brought some correction to the market and uh, peers will share with us some of the latest trends and um, possibilities afforded by the prime office market um, for potential investors as well as occupiers. Um, we'll start with a brief presentation by each of our four speakers, followed by a panel discussion and Q&A. As I mentioned, um, please put your questions in the chat box and uh, we'll be going through and consolidating uh, common questions and then we'll put them to our speakers at the end. Uh, okay, our first speaker, Dixon. Dixon Wong was appointed Head of Financial Services at Invest Hong Kong in March 2019. Before joining Invest Hong Kong, he held various senior positions in a number of different departments at an international bank for more than 20 years. Before that, he worked in the assurance and advisory department of a big four international accounting firm. Dixon holds an LLB and an MBA degree from the UK. He is also a chartered accountant in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, a fellow certified public accountant, FCPA in Hong Kong, and a fellow chartered secretary, FCIS in UK and FCS in Hong Kong. Dixon is also a member of the Hong Kong TDC Financial Services Advisory Committee and also a member of the steering committee of the Asian Financial Forum. Over to you, uh, Dixon. Thank you, Casey. Um, let me uh, get to my PowerPoint. Huh? Um, Hi, can you guys see the PowerPoint on screen? Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Casey, for your introduction. And good afternoon to our guests and also participants from Asia. And good morning to those uh, dialing in from Europe. Uh, I'm Dixon Wong from EMS Hong Kong. Uh, today's topic is uh, on new opportunities in financial services uh, from closer integration with GBA. Um, 
I would also like to thank uh, Collius for co-hosting this webinar with BMS Hong Kong. Uh, we also would like to welcome all guests and participants who dialed in the, and uh, join us today for this uh, hot topic. So this is my brief overview uh, of today's topic. Um, and we are talk about opportunities, the tax relief and facilitation measures, as well as a new uh, policy and specific opportunities available in the GBA from a financial point of view. So in very short um, narrative, uh, with a population of more than uh, 70, 71 million uh, population and a combined GDP of US dollars, uh, 1.6 trillion. Uh, actually GBA as highlighted by Casey, uh, Hong Kong is part of it and the GBA represents a significant growth opportunity for financial uh, institutions. Uh, the recent launch of the Wealth Management Connect and potentially uh, Insurance Connect and uh, as well as the PE, we call the Private Equity uh, Connect, will offer greater product diversity for GBA residents and an expanded uh, investor base uh, for financial institutions. As you can see here, uh, a comparison with the world's major Bay Areas on land, population and GDP. Uh, GBA uh, represent a significant opportunities for uh, compared to the rest of other Great Bay areas. And on the G for the GBA, primarily it contributes a, a total GDP 1.6 trillion US dollar alone. Uh, it ranks for a number number I think 13 in the world. And opportunities in GBA. Uh, the key strengths in the city. So um, we, I just highlight four major ones here, including Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou, as well as Macau. So Shenzhen, as we all know, there's more a national uh, innovation hub. Hong Kong is being an international financial transportation and trade centers. Uh, Guangzhou is more like a national a core city and inter integrated a gateway city. Um, Macau is obviously the, the a world-class tourism and national center. So uh, within GBA, there's a lot of uh, diversity uh, in terms of the uh, services provided. Uh, the economic and infrastructural activities are developing and expanding from the East Bank, including Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and Dongguan, to the West Bank, including Zhuhai, Shandong, uh, Dongshan, and Macau as well. Um, this shows uh, Hong Kong's being highly international business environment and also um, specializing in advanced manufacturing and the consumer base of altogether 70 million people in total. And according to um, a survey, uh, GBA companies investors are looking upon tapping into the market of Shenzhen, Zhuhai, and Kuang Kuang. And it's expected that the business uh, despite COVID, I think uh, we'll, we'll assume, resume to normal uh, in the second half, 2020. And this is a quick summary of tax relief and facilitation measures. Uh, and I, won't, I don't want to go through the details of this, uh, but you, you can have a read on that. Uh, more specifically on Wealth Management Connect, um, a uh, generally speaking, Wealth Management Connect is categorized as a South Bank and North Bank to enable cross-boundary investment while ensuring the closed loop capital flow. Uh, it is actually an arrangement under, the, under which uh, individual residents uh, in the GBA can carry out cross-boundary investments uh, in wealth, wealth management products distributed by the banks uh, within the GBA. In terms of South Bank for residents of the mainland in the GBA to access offshore wealth management products uh, through designated uh, intermediaries, for example, banks in Hong Kong and Macau. North Bank refers to uh, more relevant for uh, Macau and Hong Kong residents to access uh, off onshore PLC wealth management products uh, through the designated uh, custodians in mainland cities within GBA. Uh, so the key features, 
I just want to highlight the, the scope of eligible investors. So uh, we anticipate the eligible investor uh, is an individual resident in the city within GBA for a minimum period and holds a minimum threshold of financial assets and also holds and maintains a designated investment account in Hong Kong and on Macau uh, or mainland. Um, for Southbound um, Connect investors continue to be subject to the aggregate, aggregate and also investor uh, quota of uh, foreign exchange remittance. I think currently it is a 50,000 US dollar per year uh, with respect to the cross boundary remittance of funds. Um, I think key features uh, actually uh, it must be residents in the GBA, simple and no risk, uh, eligible products, uh, one to one bundling of the remittance and investment accounts, uh, closed loop cost cross uh, boundary RMB fund flow uh, with quota limits. So basically, there are three major type of bank accounts operating uh, within GBA. Uh, as you can see on the screen here, uh, type one. Uh, GBA residents uh, who require most comprehensive banking services. Uh, this is the most relevant one for the wealth management um, users. Type two, uh, more relevant for those who are working uh, in GBA. Uh, for those Hong Kong or Macau residents who work in the GBAs and need a higher transfer limit, then uh, usually they're working there, then uh, type two is relevant. For type three uh, is relevant for those travelings uh, in the GBA, for example, for leisure, for fun, for shopping. So if you hold a WeChat account, you can use that you know, uh, to pay uh, the expenses, um, uh, eating, shopping there. So in terms of the uh, opening of a bank account in GBA for Hong Kong residents, there are some participating banks. As part of the development of the GBA uh, in fulfilling the, the demand for, for financial services among the Hong Kong residents who travel, work, and live in mainland. A regulatory approval has been granted by the mainland authorities to allow Hong Kong citizens to open mainland personal accounts in the city without, have, without having to travel to the mainland for the applications. So these are the participating banks. And uh, people who want to get uh, to open a bank account there, uh, my understanding is they can do that remotely without physically visiting China. I think it opened the accounts here in Hong Kong. So this is actually a summary of uh, how to operate a bank account here in Hong Kong. So mobile payments in the GBA is uh, uh, very common and also according to the survey among uh, respondents from the GBA, uh, about 96% of the mainland respondents who use the digital payments in the past 12 months said they use the Alipay or WeChat Pay. Uh, I think uh, Alipay is more, more preferred than WeChat Pay, slightly, uh, according to the survey. Insurance Connect is another major step. Uh, this is a proposed uh, uh, scheme. So uh, the Insurance Connect will be another major or big step for the GBA with two service centers expected to be set up by the end of the year. And that uh, the plan involves setting up service centers in Shenzhen and one other uh, mainland Chinese city featuring counters for Hong Kong insurers. And uh, Hong Kong firms will be limited to handling claims, processing payments of the mainland uh, clients. So the proposed service centers will adopt a shared office model. So we need to wait and go and get more granular uh, from the from the uh, authorities in due course. So this is another major step, according to the news. Family office. Uh, obviously, GBA, as I mentioned earlier, the population, the GDP, as well as the growth of this of the GBA, it contributes to the robust wealth uh, growth momentum in Greater China. Uh, 80,000 ultra high net worth families in Greater China increasing by around 20% in the past three years. And uh, more than 17,000 ultra high net worth families are in the Greater Bay area. So it represents 20% of the uh, uh, total mainland uh, Greater China ultra high net worth families in Brick the Bay area. So uh, this is a major focus uh, for us and all institutions uh, 
uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, we are number one for capital markets fundraising in Asia, and I'm sure my colleague uh, Herman will talk more about a deep dive on, on the capital market fundraising in Asia, and Hong Kong being number one for capital markets. Uh, 2020 to date, uh, total market capitalization is around uh, 5,000 billion US dollar. And uh, uh, in terms of the equity capital markets, uh, in the last seven months from January to July, we've got 88 IPO done uh, versus uh, 20, 2019, uh, the same period of time is 84. So we have four more compared to 2019. And then the number of biotech uh, IPOs, uh, we've got uh, six in the first seven months versus nine last year. Uh, so it's a very uh, significant and also ripened capital markets in Hong Kong. Um, as you can see here, Hawk Stock Exchange said is seeing a spike in inquiries about secondary listings from Chinese firms. And the, the attraction of secondary listing include the possibility of a lower cost of equity, easier to raise mainland capital, as well as greater financial flexibility despite uh, the trade war and also the geopolitical tensions. And in particular, the Ant Financial is coming, uh, which is uh, including both A and H dual listing, potentially raising for another uh, 30 billion US dollar in Hong Kong IPO. So uh, this is another major, uh, a huge MAC IPO coming, upcoming. And these three recent MAC IPO deals in the sort of change of Hong Kong, obviously uh, uh, making Hong Kong as a top uh, IPO center. So Alibaba Group raised the 13 US dollar billion in Hong Kong, JD.com 3.9 billion, and net is in June, early this year, 3.1 million Hong Kong dollar. So all these, uh, actually, whenever financial institutions consider uh, where to sell up, uh, we'll have to take into account of the uh, you know, family office, uh, PE fund, and also a family of uh, the capital markets in Hong Kong, which is a very uh, positive attractions. And also on this, uh, investment opportunities, mainland Chinese, mainland China echoes the engagement of Hong Kong PE funds in the financing of innovation and technology enterprises in the GBA. The number of unicorns in the GBA and the valuations are growing as well. And limited partnership fund in Hong Kong, industry players expect that um, mainland Chinese GPs with a predominantly Chinese investor base would be very keen and the first users of the scheme and the rest of other international focused GP may uh, will look at this and then I'm sure they will they will take tap on this into this uh, very soon. So the new limited partnership fund regime was introduced just I think two weeks ago. Uh, it was in, into operation on the 31st of August a very positive demand, a total of 11 applications received it on the first day on 31st August 2020. So the new regime further promotes Hong Kong PE market and drive demand for uh, relevant professional services and also in turn strengthen Hong Kong's position as an IFC. Hong Kong's as, as well, it also helps asset and wealth management ecosystem, uh, especially the development of uh, PE and VC funds. And in particular, focusing on the GBA as an investment as theme. FinTech, uh, virtual banking, FinTech development progress in Hong Kong, uh, the number of uh, FinTech companies and startups operating in Hong Kong uh, reached over 600. Uh, Hong Kong's granted uh, eight virtual banking licensees and another four uh, virtual insurers. So the new regulatory framework uh, on the virtual uh, asset trading platform is expected uh, very soon. So um, actually you can see at the bottom of the slide, there are altogether, you know, the eight virtual banks and three, uh, four virtual insurance uh, have already got the license. Three um, virtual banking licensee have started operating and the rest of the other four virtual insurers have started working as well. 
is a quick uh, overview of uh, Z, A, Zhonglan, and also A star. So um, virtual insurers, these four already started working as well. On the innovations and technology piece, Hong Kong can be a bridge and can enact as an IMT development transfer platform. So it's a good landing base for global companies and startups, national R&D centers, universal tests, uh, bad for INT solutions, INT regulation and certification, as well as access to capital. And I think uh, my colleague Casey will talk about how US Hong Kong can help uh, every investor who are interested to set up a presence in Hong Kong. And if they are here in Hong Kong already and US Hong Kong can help expand uh, the network and also help them to grow in the city. Uh, I will leave this with uh, Casey um, at the later Thank part you. of this presentation. So I hand over to you, Casey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dixon. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. I think we can all agree that there is a massive amount of activity, a hive of excitement, buzz uh, of excitement around Hong Kong and possibilities that exist for uh, financial services companies and service providers. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Herman, Herman Jen. Uh, Herman was appointed Head of Business and Professional Services at Invest Hong Kong in December 2019. Herman has over 25 years of experience in the investment banking industry. Prior to joining Invest Hong Kong, he worked at UBS, BNP Paribas, and HSBC. He was specialized in mergers and acquisitions and capital markets transactions like private capital raisings and initial public offerings, IPOs. Herman graduated uh, from the University of New South Wales in Australia with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and York University in Canada with a master's degree in business administration. Over to you, Herman. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Dixon, can you stop sharing your screen so I can take it back? Yeah, it's moving, Dixon. I can see your name and your email. Everybody, please. <laughs> Almost there. Almost there. Bear with us. Yeah? Hello, Dixon. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Herman here from EMS Hong Kong. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Um, um, as my colleague Dixon already said, uh, some of the uh, development in the capital markets in Hong Kong. Uh, let me start uh, to recap. Uh, the uh, capital markets in Hong Kong, in particular the IPO market, uh, has actually started uh, being very robust uh, exactly one year ago, uh, when um, the Asian business of On Haishu Bush, which is the largest uh, bear boring company in the world, they listed its Asian business, uh, Asian business in Hong Kong in September 2019. Uh, they raised about three billion US dollar, uh, and then it was followed by uh, uh, the, uh, the secondary listing of uh, Alibaba in about uh, November last year. Uh, so it kicked these two of the largest fundraising exercise in 2019 kick off the, uh, the capital markets uh, robustness uh, throughout the year. Uh, it's the, the momentum carry on uh, through the December and January. And then it was, there was a dip in February because of COVID-19 uh, started off in uh, China. But then uh, the market came back in uh, March and continued this uh, run uh, up to now. And uh, as you can see, and also mentioned by Dixon as well, uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange was the number one IPO market in Asia and globally it's is number two in terms of the number of new company listed and number three in terms of the fund raised in the first half of 2020. Uh, some of the biggest IPOs or secondary listing 
uh, happened in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, like JD.com and NetEast, uh, NetEast Games. And uh, other development is uh, MSCI, which is the uh, widely tracked uh, index in the world, also have a partnership with Hong Kong Stock Exchange, and they are going to launch a lot of MSCI index related financial products to the investors uh, in Asia and also around the world. And this, are the, this page uh, quoted a, a few uh, prominent leaders uh, in, or of listed company or in the financial market about their views of coming back to Hong Kong for fundraising. Uh, as you can see, uh, the CFO of Alibaba mentioned that it is very strategic for them to come back to Hong Kong for a secondary listing. And Baidu, which is the equivalent of Google in China, uh, its CEO, its chairman, Robin Lee, uh, also said that they are applying for a secondary listing in Hong Kong. And JD.com is already listed uh, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, we see that this trend will continue uh, not only because of the geopolitical tension between uh, China and US, but also because of the uh, sheer liquidity supplied by different central banks uh, around the world, and also the resilience of the economy in Asia. Uh, COVID-19 was first hit uh, to China and uh, as a result, it is widely perceived that China would be the number one country that emerged from the economic downturn uh, caused by the COVID-19. And as a result, it would benefit uh, Hong Kong and also Greater Bay as well. Uh, this page you can see, uh, we have a very good pipeline uh, coming uh, of companies coming to either IPO or secondary listings uh, in Hong Kong uh, that will go way beyond 2020. Uh, the more anticipated one is probably the uh, IPO of Ant Financial or Ant Group uh, in uh, the coming one or two months. Uh, it is uh, uh, rumored that it will be the largest IPO ever uh, globally uh, with the size of the IPO going to be around 30 billion US dollar. Uh, it's going to be a both deal listing in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Uh, not only be, uh, uh, the, 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 the technology company or the Chinese company uh, listed in Hong Kong uh, there's a benefit of it, not only because of the fundraising that exercise they can do. Um, actually, they also op they will also obtain a very uh, important status or reputable status by listing in Hong Kong. Uh, recently, uh, the Hansen Index, which is the widely followed uh, major stock market index in Hong Kong, uh, have uh, done a restructuring exercise. Uh, and we can see that Xiaomi, uh, which is the mobile phone uh, manufacturer in China, uh, and Alibaba, they are admitted uh, into the Hansen Stock, uh, stock Index. Uh, and uh, as a result, that is a uh, evidence of uh, they being very, a very important market indicator to the Asian economy uh, and China economy. So uh, the whole uh, performance of the capital markets is one of the brightest spots of the whole economy downturn caused by the COVID-19. And it's definitely have given the economy of Hong Kong and Greater Bay Area a very good financial, uh, a very good support um, and we see that it all they would also give support to the uh, commercial uh, 
real estate market to Hong Kong as well. Uh, as every one of them would need to set up a office in Hong Kong uh, to a certain extent. Uh, and actually a lot of them would at least set up a investor relationship office in Hong Kong as well. Uh, so uh, the capital market is a very important pillar in supporting the current economic downturn. Uh, this cover my uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, here is my contact. So if any one of you have questions, welcome to email it to me. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, as you say, uh, the uh, financial markets are a bright spot among this rather gloomy um, environment that we are seeing today. Uh, following on, we have, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Rocky Tong. Uh, Rocky is an economic and public policy re pro uh, research professional with a demonstrated history working in both commercial and not-for-profit uh, settings. He has over a decade of experience in macroeconomic and strategy research, regulatory and policy research, public speaking and other functions. Uh, through working with these people directly, uh, Rocky has established strong relationships with uh, senior government officials, regulators, business executives, standard, standard setters, and academics in the Asia Pacific markets. Rocky is active in community service and has been invited to sit on numerous government and school related committees, including the Citizens Advisory Committee on community relations of the ICAC, which is short for the Independent Commission Against Corruption. For those of you who don't know the ICAC, ICAC is actually um, Hong Kong's um, secret weapon. Hong Kong in the 70s was rampant with corruption and uh, the ICAC was set up in 1974 to fight that. And uh, almost overnight, uh, completely cleaned up Hong Kong um, to uh, set the uh, a basis, a foundation for business to thrive. So uh, thank you, Rocky, for serving on, on, on that. Uh, over to you, Rocky. And thank you very much for the very kind introduction, KC. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Uh, it should happen seamlessly. Can you guys see me? Uh, right. Can, can, you, can you see my slide? Okay, wonderful. So thank you very much for the very kind introduction, uh, KC. Um, and thank you very much uh, a big thanks to Invest Hong Kong and Claudius for having me uh, as a panelist for today's session. I'm very delighted to be here. And I just want to give a very short background introduction of uh, the Financial Services Development Council. Uh, we are not uh, like Invest Hong Kong, uh, a part of the government. We are not like uh, colliers uh, from the uh, commercial setting, but we are you know, a little bit of both. So uh, we are an advisory uh, body, you know, representing the market and uh, lobbying uh, the government to introduce different um, uh, policies that is conducive to the uh, sustainable development of Hong Kong's financial services industry. So uh, anything in relation to banking, capital markets development, uh, asset and wealth management, insurance, and really an anything in between uh, would be under our uh, um, Purview. However, you know, we are not a regulator and like I said, uh, uh, we are not a government um, uh, agency. So um, that's where we are. Um, okay, I am, I am not going to repeat uh, what my uh, fellow panelists have already said about uh, the Greater Bay Area, uh, because you know, they have given a very good overview of how uh, the development of Greater Bay Area would actually uh, bring benefits to not only Hong Kong, but also the region and mainland China as a whole. Um, but um, I want to highlight that, you know, that really the, the benefits uh, that the development of GBA will be mutual and inclusive. Uh, mutual meaning is not only uh, for Hong Kong uh, and not, it's not only for China, but uh, it's also for the rest of the world who are playing, uh, you know, a part in the investment uh, or business community um, that is dealing uh, with China and in today's world with China representing almost one fifth of the uh, global GDP, uh, basically uh, all the business in the world would be, um, you know, having some part of relevance to uh, um, mainland China. 
And uh, I would also like to highlight that, you know, like the development of the Greater Bay Area is actually a, a national strategy and is policy co uh, coordinated by the state council and the central government. So a lot of people would argue that, you know, there are a lot of uh, policies introduced by government, be it regional or uh, city level. Um, well, it is not comparable. Uh, what GBA is going to bring about is more efficient policy coordination, uh, among others. So, um, and, and, you know, on this basis, and, and in light of such background, uh, the FSDC has been doing quite a bit of work in relation to that, and our market participants, who are members, to, uh, members in our committees, have been, you know, very excited and thrilled about the development of the Greater Bay Area. So in uh, June 2020, uh, which is like uh, two and a half months ago, we um, published a report on, uh, and uh, this is the title, Hong Kong's unique role in enhancing financial connectivity in the Greater Bay Area. So we set forth five uh, main recommendations, and I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about them uh, in the following slides. Um, really, the, all these uh, recommendations are in relation to uh, the flows between um, the rest of the world and the mainland. And Hong Kong is the middleman, uh, you know, like connecting uh, these dots. Uh, these flows would include people flow, uh, flows of goods and services, as well as the flow of capital. And, and uh, you know, like uh, this is uh, the framework set forth in uh, our report. The uh, first recommendation is to connect payment and the transfer infrastructure in the Greater Bay Area. And why we are doing this is that, you know, if there will be more people, for, uh, you know, traveling and living in, um, in, in these cities uh, in the Greater Bay Area, they would need to have access to payment system that will allow them to pay, um, uh, you know, uh, make payments in, in these cities respectively. So uh, this is uh, uh, one thing that we uh, have in the back of our mind. Uh, as many of you would agree, in mainland China, uh, it is known as a cashless society almost. Uh, so uh, people don't really bring their cash or wallet. Instead, they use the e-wallet um, and e-payment system such as WeChat Pay and Alipay, which uh, Dixon has already mentioned earlier. Uh, and in that regard, you know, Hong Kong also has developed a platform that would allow uh, all these um, all these um, uh, payment system to be linked uh, on the same platform, and this is called the faster payment system. Uh, the faster payment system is uh, really a wealth of, uh, it is a treasure to uh, the Hong Kong people, and we have seen its usage boosting up uh, quite a bit in the first eight months of this year, um, perhaps in part due to uh, the development of COVID situation, and people do not really want to, uh, you know, have, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, cash uh, that could contain uh, viruses, uh, so, so to speak. So um, and for, for the first eight months uh, of 2020, we have seen uh, the accounts, uh, op uh, new accounts of FPS uh, increasing by 1.7 million uh, um, in just the first month. Uh, this is, you know, really, really, uh, you know, like a, a notable increase. We have also seen that you know, the average daily real-time transaction uh, reaching 400,000 uh, per day. Uh, this is uh, representing some 1.4 times uh, of increase comparing to last year. So this is telling you that you know, like uh, FPS is being well received in Hong Kong. And we do believe that uh, even though there is already payment systems such as uh, WeChat Pay and Alipay in uh, in, in mainland China, we wish to bring this to uh, the Greater Bay Area. For that, you know, it is a cross, um, a, a cross payment platform infrastructure that allows everything to be bundled uh, in one, one go. And this is exactly what we are, um, you know, promoting or recommending here. We also uh, recommend that, you know, there should be um, uh, you know, gradual increase in the daily cross boundary remittance limit. But uh, Dixon has already mentioned it, so I'm not going to go too much into detail. Uh, the number two recommendation that we have put forward uh, for the government's consideration, uh, sorry, this should be number three. Yes, 
So uh, the second one is to enhance the convenience of remote account opening. Again, this is really much related to uh, the livelihood of people for that they are living not only in one place, but perhaps have second home in um, you know, like different cities, uh, which would be uh, having a much lower uh, cost of living uh, you know, uh, comparing to Hong Kong. Um, so um, uh, we want them to not only have asset, uh, allow them to have payment, but uh, if they want to establish uh, or create a new account, we want them to have uh, a higher level of convenience. Right now, like Victor has already mentioned, uh, we have uh, we, we we see that you know, there's certain institution allowing uh, as a pioneer to open um, accounts uh, across the border without a physical presence. Um, we want them to uh, um, we want them to extend this pioneer program to more institutions first. Then we also want to have uh, the different types of um, uh, um, accounts opening to be uh, permitted uh, using this uh, remote uh, remote manner. You know, this is something that we uh, really wish to see um, because you know, uh, type one accounts, like Dixon has already mentioned, uh, is in relation to wealth management and investment uh, activities, and this is uh, something that you know Hong Kong is striving and uh, excel in. So you know, we want to uh, make that. Uh, you know, strengthen our strengths uh, in that regard. The third recommendation is also in relation to likelihood. Because, you know, some people may be living in Hong Kong, but they want to purchase uh, some uh, properties in the mainland. Right now, you know, like they can uh, have some mortgages a lot, uh, permitted and ext extended by banks who have branches uh, or banking relationship with uh, lo uh, with local um, um, network. So we want them to uh, extend this uh, to uh, banking institutions that may not have branches in uh, other GBA cities, so to speak. Uh, this is something that we have seen uh, some progress, as you can see on this slide, uh, at the bottom of this slide that, uh, you know, like in uh, er earlier this month, the, the government uh, in um, the the governments in the Greater Bay Area has stated that there would be some uh, development going forward, and we really an anticipate some development uh, to be um, announced not to, in the not too distant future. Fourthly, um, we want to develop cross-boundary insurance business. Uh, when you think about it, um, there are bridges connecting Hong Kong with Zhuhai and, and Macau. Uh, think about you know how the, all these uh, uh, vehicles owners and holders drivers they are you know exposing to risk of having accidents you know like on the bridge itself so um, think about how that is going to, to create some ambiguity for that you know their current policy would only allow uh, would only cover accidents that occur either in Hong Kong or in mainland or in Macau. So there, there is an urgent need for them to um, have policies covering all these, uh, all three jurisdictions. Uh, so this is something in relation to, again, livelihood. So uh, of course, you know, we understand that in the very first space, uh, it is likely, it's more likely than not that, you know, uh, the Insurance Connect will only permit uh, insurance firms to establish uh, insurance service center in the Greater Bay Area uh, cities. However, we, we want to see further development, as I mentioned earlier, meaning uh, to develop uh, a cross-boundary um, uh, insurance policies. Uh, and the fifth recommendation set forth in our report published in June this year is about the Wealth Management Connect, uh, which we have seen some development um, uh, not only from last year, but also uh, in um, June this year, and also uh, in more uh, recent times. So uh, we acknowledge that there, that there must be risk exposed. Uh, you know, investors are exposed to different risk level and appetite. But we do believe that um, Hong Kong as a risk um, management expert, uh, we do uh, offer a different type of um, investment vehicles for mainland investors to consider. 
At the same time, uh, due to the um, uh, differences in risk appetite, as also uh, as well as you know, like uh, investment vehicle availability in the mainland, Hong Kong um, investors would be very interested in investing uh, in wealth management products available only to mainland investors for now. So we want this wealth management connect to be um, uh, launched very soon. Uh, we understand that you know at the very first phase we will only see a uh, um, bank to bank connected and that is on the basis that it is something that will make sure that risk can be more controlled and contained uh, because it's a closed loop design however uh, we believe that in the longer run there will be a more uh, availability and flexibility for the regulators in, on the two sides to design something that is more flexible and uh, will be able to um, benefit a broader spectrum of financial services participants. Uh, that would be very much my presentation. Um, of course, you know, the Greater Bay Area is not only about, you know, these five areas, uh, like uh, Dixon and um, Herman have already mentioned, family office is uh, one of those. And also, green, uh, we have published a report uh, in Ju July this year in relation into that, and we worked very closely with uh, Dixon and team uh, in that regard. Uh, also, in terms of green finance and ESG investment, we are also working on a report in relation to the Greater Bay Area. Last but not the least, uh, in terms of Renminbi internationalization, I think Hong Kong still has much room to play, uh, much role to play. Uh, so uh, I'll pass it back to Casey, and here's for uh, the uh, other presentation. But thank you very much for the kind attention. Thank you very much, Rocky. That was very, very interesting indeed. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. I think the, the we're only just beginning to see the uh, the potential from the uh, integration uh, between the different regions um, uh, in mainland and Hong Kong and Macau. Um, and there's actually a lot more to look forward to. Uh, this is just the beginning. Uh, last but not least, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Piers Stewart. Piers. Uh, Piers is a director in the tenant representation team at Colliers, having worked in the industry for over 10 years. Piers specializes in, in working with occupiers in the finance industry, in particular the asset management and private equity sectors. Over to you, Piers. Thanks, Casey. I will share my screen. Is that all clear? If that's, uh, if that's so, then uh, thank you indeed. And, and good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, again for joining us. Uh, we have around 10 minutes, uh, which I'll aim to give you an overview of, of the Hong Kong office market, trends and occupy movement, uh, and also where some opportunities lie uh, for tenants. So perhaps let's begin by setting some context on the historical movement of the A-grade office market. The, the graph here shows CBD rental performance over time using the average net rents in the, in the district across the CBD, which is about 21 million square feet of office space. The main message here to highlight is, is the more recent performance um, since 2014, I guess, highlighted in the yellow box. The most recent upward curve began then, indeed, in 2014, um, following the announcement of the Hong Kong Shanghai Stock, uh, Stock Connect, which, which really drove a, a large amount of demand and influx of um, PRC occupiers uh, into, into Hong Kong's prime, uh, prime office market. Um, it's worth noting on that that 54% roughly of occupiers in the CBD are finance related. Um, so whenever there's an introduction or movement in the financial markets, uh, this typically mirrored uh, in time by the, the CBD office market. Now, the upward curve continued or has continued for the last five years up until the middle of uh, last year, where vacancy rates were around the 1% mark. Um, and then since then, since June 2019, uh, we've had an adjustment, which I'll come on to, um, originally sparked by, by, the, by the local unrest. Now, uh, the, the decline has continued since then. Um, it's been exacerbated by uh, COVID at the start of this year. Um, and, and, and obviously adding to, to the negative sentiment in Hong Kong. The real estate market here is very sentiment uh, driven. It reacts very quickly to, to these kind of changes. Um, but however, you know, from a tenant, tenant perspective, um, this is actually positive news. The market snapshot here illustrates the changes in that rental performance um, across the various districts since uh, 2018. 
2018, you know, into the first quarter of 2019 was really um, the kind of final stages of, of the, the upward curve um, in a very positive economic environment and strong demand for both central and prime space, as well as the decentralized locations. Um, you know, the demand for decentralized locations came predominantly from the unaffordable levels or rental levels in central and those MNC occupiers seeking more cost effective solutions. Um, there was also a number of buildings that completed that offered uh, those cost effective solutions to, to occupiers. Um, again, like I said, uh, until the middle of last year, the, the upward curve continued. And then in 2019, we really saw uh, the, the, the adjustment begin with around 6% adjustment towards the end of 2019 uh, last year. Um, the vacancy rates have also coupled, uh, coupled this decline um, began to increase. Um, the secondary vacancy, large amounts of it coming back to the market, particularly um, towards the start of uh, this year as well. Year to date, we've seen a decline of around 13% in CBD rents. Um, this is basically making rents in the CBD a bit more affordable. Um, it also is being reflected in decentralized areas, Wan Chai, Causeau Bay, Quarry Bay as well. Um, the vacancy rate is now uh, highest since 2005. Um, and also, you know, positive news for occupiers in that there's more space in the market to choose from. The Skyline report here um, shows the, the kind of overall picture, if you like, of, of, of prime office buildings in the CBD um, with the white squares you know, illustrating leased space, the light blue currently vacant uh, premises, the dark blue future available space and the red surrender or indirect stock where occupiers are looking to exit from leases early. If we had a look at the Skyline report about a year and a half ago, there would be a lot more white on it, um, obviously due to very low vacancy rates um, in the sub 2% range. The main message here um, is the significant future vacancy coming up across the, the CBD, an additional 4% to the already 5.9% sitting vacant in, in the CBD, and by which you know, potentially vacancy rates reaching double digits. The major pockets of vacancy are primarily due to occupiers uh, decentralizing. Two examples of that being the SFC and Ernst & Young, who've both recently moved um, in excess of 150,000 square feet out of central. The weak demand across the market um, also leaves question marks on where this space will be backfilled from um, in the prime buildings and, and by which it, it's created uncertainty among landlords um, who, for the most part, have adjusted accordingly. Uh, lowering rents and increased uh, offering increased incentives to attract um, tenants to backfill some of this space. I've talked uh, very briefly about the the overview of the market. Let me come on to uh, some of the future developments across Hong Kong, not just in the CBD um, that is that is creating opportunity for 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 tenants to to locate here. Now, this map highlights uh, the significant new developments across the whole of Hong Kong. As I said, various districts. I'll share the details of four of these, um, being the West Kowloon Cultural District, uh, two developments in Central. The development of uh, Taiku Place in Quarry Bay and also Airside in Kowloon East. I should also mention that some of the new infrastructure developments that you can see here on the map um, related to the MTR network highlighted in, in the red and the dark blue dotted lines uh, illustrating the two phases of completion of the shot into Central Link um, which will improve links from the border um, into the CBD. So to Murray Road and, and Chung Kong Center, you know, this will bring roughly a million square feet of prime grade A office space to the CBD. Uh, some much needed supply, frankly, in, in the district. So given the last premium grade A uh, office building in the CBD was AIA Central completed in 2005. Now the developments will complete almost in tandem with each other, uh, Q2 and Q3 respectively of 2023 with rents are uh, likely to be well in excess of $100. Uh, to Murray Road um, is likely to attract uh, whole floor occupiers, floor plate of about 16,000 square feet, better suited to larger banks, law firms perhaps, uh, and some of the larger PRC finance security firms uh, needing to be in central. Chung Kong Center too, slightly different floor plate, um, attracting slightly different occupiers, um, perhaps the smaller ones given the floor plate 
is uh, is more suited to those occupiers given the design. So perhaps towards the finance to the to the hedge fund and private equity occupiers. Sorry, um, instead. So with both of these developments, we'll see an extension to the core CBD um, area moving eastward around Chater Garden, um, and without an improved link between the core CBD area and perhaps Admiralty. Across the water over to the West Kowloon Cultural District and XRL development. Now, uh, the map here shows that uh, these uh, developments sit around International Commerce Center, ICC, which many people will be familiar of, uh, and, and likewise Kowloon Station. Now, firstly, uh, WKCD, the West Kowloon Cultural District, um, is, is a large uh, development of you know comprising of nine million square feet of commercial space uh, including hotels arts cultural venues residential retail and indeed office accommodation uh, the provisions for the office accommodation around three million square feet uh, to be developed ac across various sites um, the blue boxes there in front of Kowloon station on the map the timing of this um, some of the developments for the cultural uh, sites is already underway, but for the office accommodation, um, more towards 2023-2024. Uh, to the right side of Kowloon Station is the XRL site, um, a site right above the high-speed rail into uh, China. Recently acquired by Sun Hung Kai uh, for commercial development, it will offer a further 3 million square feet uh, of office space to, to the oh, so of, of commercial space, sorry, to the district. 2.85 million square feet of that will be for office and the remaining likely retail space. Uh, the development set for completion around 2025. Next uh, to Island East, Quarry Bay, um, with the development or further development of Taiku Place, a district uh, you know, traditionally dominated by the back offices for banks and insurance, but that's now changed dramatically over the last couple of years, uh, given the holistic approach that Swire have taken to, to the development of the area. Somewhat driven by rents and high rents in the CBD, uh, improved connectivity with that CBD using the, the Wan Chai bypass has, has attracted a lot of front offices now for major law firms, banks and other financial, in, financial institutions. The next building is Two Taiku Place. It is set for uh, completion around Q2 2022, about 850,000 square feet of prime office space coming into, uh, into the district. And rents, again, to be decided, but probably somewhere between 40 and $70 per square foot. Uh, the completion of this building as well will, will add more amenity space to the district as well as F&B and really encompassing a holistic vision that Swire have for the area. Last but not least, uh, over to Airside, Kowloon East, the old Kai Tak um, runway area. Nanfeng uh, have uh, acquired a site and are, are developing uh, what is called Airside uh, in amongst the district that is really referred to as CBD2, uh, you know, a, a function of the major investment in infrastructure across uh, the Kowloon East area. Now, Airside will offer similar in a way to, to what Taiku Place is developing in terms of a holistic development, including lifestyle amenities, alfresco dining, gyms, outdoor space, and so on. Um, they will be connected very seamlessly to the MTR network. A new station at, uh, at Kai Tak will provide pretty seamless access um, across the whole of Hong Kong. It is also set to complete Q2 2022. Large floor plates of around 32,000 to 56,000 square feet are among the largest in Hong Kong and likely to attract the back office functions for large tenants across various sectors. The rental forecast, um, again, very relevant to, to everybody on the call, I think. Mac, mindful of time here, so I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, look, the, the, the rest of 2020, we see the weak overall demand uh, continuing. I mean, vacancy is continuing to increase across all districts, predominantly in the CBD. And with that, rents will continue to decline, likely into Q1, perhaps even Q2 2021. New initiatives on the Wealth Connect that have been mentioned and increased IPO activity um, may well bring an uptick in demand from PRC occupiers um, who will likely seek prime office space um, in the CBD as well. So we could see some of the backfilling of that secondary vacancy. Uh, the forecasts, um, again, they're monitored on a monthly basis. They're moving targets at the moment. Hong Kong is very sentiment uh, driven, so it does adjust um, on a fairly regular basis. 
I'll leave you very quickly with uh, some key takeaways here. Uh, again, like I said, overall demand remain, remains weak, higher vacancy um, across the whole of Hong Kong, but this is really a, a strong opportunity for occupiers to come into the market while rents are softer, while commercial terms um, are, 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 are getting reduced and, and likewise more favorable non-commercial terms being offered by, by landlords. Uh, this is set to continue over the six, you know, six to eight months, I would say. Uh, but again, very much uh, dependent on how sentiment reacts um, across the Hong Kong uh, economy. With that, Casey, mindful of time, I'll pass back to you. Thank you very much, Piers. That was very, very interesting indeed. Um, it looks like there's a lot of uh, vacancy coming online in the next two, three years. Um, this coupled with um, the softening market at the moment, it looks like there is going to be some major adjustments and as you say, I think there is a lot of opportunity for people who have been considering a presence in Hong Kong, um, but have been hesitating. Now it really is a tenants market. And um, yeah, uh, time to come in and, and have a look. Uh, what I will do is, um, mindful of the time, we are just actually have run out of time. So rather than to take questions, I have kept an eye on the chat box and I haven't seen any questions from our audience. I did have a couple pre prepared, but mindful of time, I think I'll skip that. Uh, what I'll do is I'll close, I'll do a closing and I'll leave everyone with contact details of our speakers and ourselves. And um, I invite everyone to um, go and revisit the, the, the recording. This will be made available uh, on our website. Uh, there'll be a link on the website shortly. Um, and then uh, you can revisit and review the parts that were of interest to you. Uh, a copy of the presentation material will be sent to those who have accepted to be contacted by Invest Hong Kong and Colliers. And um, don't worry if you didn't tick that box, just send any of us, myself included, an email and we'd be more than happy to send you a copy. Um, we really, really want to be in touch. Um, please stay safe, get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Hong Kong is very much open for business. Uh, now is a great time to explore opportunities afforded by all this change. Um, it's never been a better time to, to have a look at what's possible here. Um, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom in the mass media. They have an agenda. I think it's important to, to get a clear idea of what's um, available here in Hong Kong uh, for yourselves and we'd be more than happy to do the handholding with you. Um, we can get in touch and do a virtual, a remote um, and almost zero cost, zero risk uh, assessment of what Hong Kong has to offer. So I have on the screen here all our contacts. Um, I thank our speakers Dixon, Herman, Rocky and Piers for their time and so generously sharing their uh, views and insights. Um, and uh, yeah, please get in touch. Uh, we actually have uh, 31 offices around the world. So uh, we are headquartered in Hong Kong, obviously, but 31 offices around the world are serving local, um, local markets in your own uh, time zone, in your own language. So I urge you to get in touch with, our, with my colleagues. A uh, full list of their contact details are actually on our, our website. So thank you very much. With that, I wish you all a very good day and uh, goodbye. Thank you.